So, yeah, good start. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to Research Week 2022. Uh, research in the field of in the medical world, uh, we all know, holds a very important place. And here at the Rame Medical College, which is now a constituent college of the Rame University of Applied Sciences, uh, constant efforts have been made to improve the research environment. And as a result, we have been seeing uh, an ever increasing number of high quality research projects which have resulted in uh, which have resulted in a number of uh, an increasing number of international publications so all, and this has now culminated uh, now into this research week which uh, in this year the birth centenary year of our uh, founder chairman dr ms ramaya uh, we here at the Division of Research and Patents, under the guidance of Principal and Dean at Ramya Medical College, uh, have organized. Uh, the purpose of organizing this Research Week 2022 is uh, as part of uh, recognizing the efforts and uh, the achievements of the researchers at our campus, as well as serving as an inspiration uh, you know, for the coming days for further research to happen. To begin the program, remembering uh, and seeking the blessings of our beloved chairman uh, and chancellor, uh, I invite our dignitaries onto the stage to receive a token of respect from our side and to take their seat on the dais. First of all, uh, we are honored to have our uh, pro uh, vice chancellor, Professor Om Prakash Harbanda, sir. I invite sir onto the dais. Receive a token of respect from us here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Next, I would uh, like to call upon Professor Nagasuma Chandramam. She's a professor at the Department of Biochemistry at IASC. Honored to have this English perspective. Okay. Next. I would like to call upon our principal and dean at Rama Medical College, Professor Shali Mui Ma'am, who has been a driving force behind conducting this research. Meeting. <laughs> and uh, finally, I'd like to call upon uh, uh, Kumar sir, our deputy director at Work Research at RUAS, <laughs> associate professor at Community Medicine. <laughs> she works with me every day, so she has to bear it. I, I, I request everybody to <laughs> now I request everybody to stand up for the Ramya and <laughs> Jai 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 Jai
ಕಷ್ಟಾರರು ಕಟ್ಟಿದ ಕನಸಿನ ಸಾಮ್ರಾಜ್ಯವಿದು ದೀಪದಳು ಪ್ರದೀಪಗಳ ಬೆಳಗುವ ಶ್ರದ್ಧಾ ಸ್ಥಾನವಿದು ಅಮಿತ ಜ್ಞಾನತೆ ಸಾಧನ ಕ್ಷೇತ್ರವಿದು ಪ್ರತಿ ಪ್ರತಿ ಪ್ರತಿಭೆಯ ಸಾಧನೆ ಮಾಡಲು ಸ್ಫೂರ್ತಿಯ ಕೇಂದ್ರವಿದು ಅಜ್ಞಾನದ ಕತ್ತಲೆ ನೀಗುವ ಸುಜ್ಞಾನದ ಸೂರ್ಯನ ರಶ್ಮಿದು Please, I request uh, Dr. Pragnya, first year postgraduate resident of the Department of Ophthalmology, to uh, sing the invocation song and offer our prayers to the Almighty. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to sing a song regarding uh, Goddess Saraswati. Saraswati Mahti, Jaya Kura Kamti, Vada Shubha Kamti, Shambhari Di. Saraswati Mahti, Jaya Kura Kamti, Vada Shubha Kamti, Shambhari Di. Yamhami Vati, Nikhanyatri, Sabitri, Surya Narutu, Chitri Di. Yamhami Vati, Nikhanyatri, Sabitri, Surya Narutu, Chitri Di. Shambhari Di. Yamhari Di. Shri Padmani Rai Nidai Nyona Nukra Nidhiyam Shri Padmani Rai Nyona Nukra Nidhiyam Bharatanda Mandite Veena Pani Bharatanda Mandite Veena Pani Surya Samantra Viyam Brahma Swarupi Nyam Surya Samantra Vivi, Brahma Swarupi Nami. Saraswati Mahti, Jaya Kuya Kamti, Vada Shubha Kamti, Shankar Vivi. Saraswati Mahti, Jaya Kuya Kamti, Vada Shubha Kamti, Shankar Vivi. Vati Nikhayati Savitri Surya Kamti, Jamani Vati Nikhayati Savitri Surya Kamti, Thank you very much, Dr. Sakya. Now I invite all the dignitaries to inaugurate our research with 2022 by watering the plant. Not much. 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 Not much.
I uh, invite the, our beloved uh, principal and dean, uh, Professor Shalinoi, ma'am, to uh, initiate in, in, inaugurate the program with a few words. Thank you, Professor Akshay. Uh, wishing you all a very pleasant afternoon. Uh, I'm happy to see at least so many people here today. Uh, I feel it's a real privilege to uh, welcome you all to this research week with the work and the encouragement of all our previous deans and uh, faculty who are still here and some of whom have left. We have uh, finally culminated in this day. Uh, we have, uh, as you know, our uh, institution is very keen on fostering research. And recently, a slew, slew of measures have been taken to see that we support research activities in the institution. Uh, some of which, uh, let me uh, reiterate, we, our institute is DSIR recognized so that we can do uh, projects, academic and clinical trials. Uh, our ethics committee is accredited by NABH as well as by THR, Department of Health Research. And uh, we are uh, going forward with uh, furthering or increasing the people who are the members of the ethics committee so that we can deal with the increasing number of projects that are coming now due to the interest that has been generated in uh, students, postgraduates and in faculty. Uh, just in the interest of the youngsters uh, that, uh, that are here today, let me just briefly tell you the difference between basic research and uh, applied research. So, Basic research is uh, some uh, research where you want to increase your knowledge base and you answer questions like what, why, and how. For, an ex for example, why does insomnia occur or how does insomnia occur, sleep disorders? Uh, what causes it? These are some of the questions that you will answer to increase your knowledge about insomnia. And to solve a problem, whatever research you do, like how can, how can we best treat insomnia? How can we best uh, look at solving the problem of insomnia is what is applied research. So you can think of COVID also as a problem like, that is more relevant to many of you now. What is COVID? Why did it occur? How did it spread? It's basic. And how can we prevent or how can we treat cases is applied. Right? So uh, just to uh, ignite your interest in research, we would like you to also have a look at all the prize winning posters that are exhibited outside. These are all our postgraduates and undergraduate students who have won prizes in either the state or the national conferences. Uh, with this, I deem it uh, an honor to uh, welcome Dr. Nagasuma Chandra, who is a professor of biochemistry at the Indian Institute of Science. She uh, has taken time to be here with us tonight and uh, this afternoon. And I'm really uh, happy to let you know that she has received the award, the National Science Award from the Department of Health uh, Research Department of Science and Technology, sir, isn't it? So thank you. I'm also very happy and grateful to our pro vice chancellor, Dr. O.P. Kharpanga, who has taken time off from his schedule to be here with us today and encourage research. He was the uh, chief of the Department of Medical Center for Medical Education sorry, dental education and research in the All India Institute of Medical Sciences for many years. He has joined uh, us as the Pro Vice Chancellor of Health Sciences in the Ramaya University of Health Sciences, Applied Sciences. He is a recipient of various awards. He's an author of several research papers and books which are read worldwide. So thank you and welcome. I'd also like to uh, welcome all our faculty who have, uh, you know, 
taken this much uh, effort to come here and be with us on research day and our students who have taken the interest to do some research activity in their particular fields of interest. I, I thank the Department of uh, Division of Research and Patents, Dr. Nandakumar, Dr. Tanuja, Dr. Rade, uh, Dr. Akshay, Dr. Divya is not here today and uh, both are young people, uh, Preeti Parna and Monica for uh, having worked so hard to make this week happen, which we have been thinking of from a long time. We started with research awards last year and we want to continue it further. So uh, thank you all and welcome. Thank you very much, ma'am. On this occasion of Research Week, it's only uh, fitting and we feel blessed to have a distinguished faculty, uh, Professor Oaks, uh, Om Prakash Karpanda sir amongst, to be amongst us. He's a distinguished faculty in the world of health research, health education and innovation. Sir uh, has been conferred with the prestigious ICMR Dr. C.G. Pandit National Chair, which he holds. He has also previously served as the Chief of Center for Dental Education and Research. There has also been a uh, professor and head of the Division of Orthodontics and Dentofacial uh, Deformities at AIMS, New Delhi. And during this time at AIMS, he was also uh, uh, steering the National Oral Health Program uh, in order for uh, community dental health improvement. And he also helped to establish a dedicated dental research, health research facility, the NAIRIHES. Uh, sir has also served as the chief of uh, Center for Medical uh, Education Training, Innovation and Advisory through the Union Health Ministry. Uh, sir is an international authority on uh, not limited to but on orthodontics, cleft lip and cleft palate as well as uh, dental education. So has uh, served as a director at WHO for collaborating center on oral health promotion. And, uh, sir has also been a visiting professor at multiple institutes in Australia and the United States. Uh, so I uh, I uh, request Sir to say a few words on this occasion of Research Week and share his words of wisdom. <laughs> you have missed out. Sir has been recently conferred as Emeritus Professor no? in, in the prestigious NAMS, National Academy of Medical Sciences. That's a very prestigious honor. <laughs> <laughs> we are honored to have uh, Sir uh, at our, with us. He is uh, a very enthusiastic clinician, researcher, innovator, and most of all a teacher. So, we request Sir to, to share some words with him. Now, since your last word was wisdom, so I just first of all I say namaste and thank you, Dr. Shani. <clears throat> and the you know, the nice guys, particularly Dr. Nanda Kumar and the uh, well, invited speaker uh, on the Institute of Science. And particularly, I am told that her major interest is in tuberculosis, uh, and she's trying to identify some specific proteins in that respect. So, I will come to that a little later, but before that, I just wish to say. That they say that uh, there is an information, there is a knowledge, there is a wisdom. So now information is available everywhere. So, so students need not to come to class because so they can download much more. They are much more informed than, than we are informed. And then comes wisdom. <clears throat> but in between there is knowledge. So information, knowledge and wisdom. So knowledge is something some people have, but they don't contribute. So those who contribute, they become teachers. But in addition to the knowledge, those who become senior and gray and they have more experience, they are also wise people. So they need some wisdom also. Mm -hmm. So a few things which you cannot find in books or which you cannot find from knowledge, you get from senior people who are, who are wise or they can give you wisdom. And this is particularly true with the clinical sciences where small tricks of handling the, for example, handling a tissue, how to hold a nerve, or how to clamp a minor vessel, or things like this. So, for example, in the field of ophthalmics, it's still much more delicate. 
So that comes there. So that was wisdom. So since you said wisdom, I thought let me explain it. Now, my interest uh, with health has been uh, a very, very different story. Because when I was a child, my uh, uncle, my, my uncle's friend was a physician. So, so he told me that, and his son and myself used to study together, you know, I, and I was mostly in their house rather than in their house. And he told me that, um, that in our city where I grew up, that he is able to find a good eye surgeon, he can find a good gynecologist, he can find a good surgeon, but he cannot find a good dental surgeon. So, why don't you opt to become a, choose this profession and practice? as a first priority. So I chose that profession. Now, we heard the, the life course change. I ended up in Ames and where the, our department was very small. And we started postgraduate course. Now the challenge was how to balance between huge number of patients who come to Ames and do a specialized service and then super specialized service. And this challenge, we, we had to struggle out to create a postgraduate center for dental education in such as the under thousand square foot area. And, the, and in fact, the first postgraduate student uh, who was with us in 1985, so her work was on, on facial proportions of cleft patients, but normal parents. So we, we examined their facial widths. Everybody was looking at lens, but we thought they have to be different. Why I have to tell you this story is that you have to think differently. You have to think critically. You have to have analyzing power to be able to create new things. And one of the examples of innovation is you have just seen that you could light a lamp, but you could also water the plant. So that's innovation. So innovation doesn't have to come through a very big labs. Even discovery of penicillin was only by keen observation. So as a, as a clinician, we have to be, of course, keen observer, but as a researcher also, you have to be keen observer, not only in your lab, but even around you. Even around you. Uh, and this innovation can be useful to anything in your life, day to day life. It doesn't have to be medicine. Uh, for example, uh, if you want to take a break up these stairs on the third floor, could you devise a, a step ladder which can take it like this and you reach up there or bring it down? One person can do the same thing. You don't need four persons to do that. So that is innovation. So it is not necessary that if you are a doctor, you are thinking only about innovation or your thought process is limited to this. So keep your mind open, keep your eyes open and think laterally as well. So that work, coming back to that work, when we send it to US, uh, we have a public health they are not called angle orthodontics. This is very, very eminent. The editor was Dr. Trumpini. So we, those days there was no internet. So you could only send by post. It comes back with certain changes, telling us that you have included a sample of cleft palate only also in the cleft lip. So it has to be excluded because they have different genetic materials. So fair enough. So you, if you want to resubmit the paper, you might have to redo the entire statistics again. And it is up to you whether you want to consider it or not. So we went to the statistics department. We were very good friends. Um, and Dr. Sundaram, he is now, he lives in Kochi now. He, he was from, from Kerala. He was a professor there. And those days there were no computers, there were only calculators, you know. So he fed a calculator, separated groups, revised the data, gave the results. We wrote the discussion again and sent it back. So in one week time, it went back in 10 days' time or 12 days' time, it reached to the office of Dr. Trump. It so happened that I attended a meeting in San Francisco and I have never seen him. So I was looking for that person, Dr. Trump. So coming from India, you know, you want to meet a editor of a journal. So I went there, I shook hands with him. Then thinking, I think I know you. What is your name? But then you have some manuscript submitted. I said, yes. He tells me, but everything is okay. But tell me how within 10 days you could revert <laughs> with the entire data. I said, this is India. So the point I'm trying to make is that if you want to do something, you can do it. That is the message I'm trying to give you. 
as an example. And so, so first, first, first graduate with us. First thesis published in angle orthodontics. So that means our that we were that minuscule and overnight we became that great. So whenever you think, think big also. So if you are planning to do research, it is also a passion. It is also an addiction, I wish to tell you. That once you start doing research, you won't be able to live without it. Like somebody is addicted to tea, somebody is addicted to coffee. But research is an addiction. So to cut this story short, what I'm trying to say is that if you are, and it is, can also be a career. Only clinical science is not a career. And as a clinician, you can also be a researcher. I wish to tell you, man, with biochemistry department, we our most of the impact articles are with biochemistry, particularly because we were trying to see what happens when we put the implant around the tissue, what are the biomarkers of bone remodeling and inflammation. And this work has been highly cited. And this people do because we were interested in biochemistry. Um, so also think of collaboration. Think of a novel thing. And that from that, about working with seven, eight years, nine years, we realized that this implant surface requires adhesion from the gingiva, from the epithelial band through hemidastrosomes, which does not exist. And that is the reason why implant fails. So we ended up into doing two PhD thesis on this, and we started modifying the surface of titanium, medical grade titanium, so that adhesion of epithelial cells could be conducive, so that there is a barrier for microbial in impression from the gingival curricular throat, uh, gingival curricular sulcus into the bone, and that is success. Now, that was the work which we did, and then the point I'm trying to make is that work also eventually became so great that before we could patent that technology, people from overseas who took this idea and started working on it, and some commercial product also came. So now, when you do research, you have to also see how to protect it. So here comes Dr. Nandakumar. <laughs> so he will help you to protect your thinking, protect your products, protect your rights. Because if you have patent, if you have uh, knowledge, that also needs to be seen that how to disseminate, where to disseminate, and at what level to disseminate uh, by protecting your own intellectual property about it. So intellectual property is an integral part of the Results then because and also I would like to say that I like to congratulate all of you those who have received awards in national and um, state conferences. But I think uh, you should think bigger. Think think bigger. Think global. We are no less. The only thing is that sometimes we do not put the things in the right perspective. We have data, but our data is not clean. We clean the data. We are left with a small sample. We are left with a small sample. Our work does not get published. And if sometime our work is very good, the international journal will start thinking that we are managing data. That is the other issue. So we have to develop credibility of research. So cred developing credibility in research is also very, very important in life. And it will not come overnight. It will take you 10 years for you to establish as a researcher. And once your credibility is established, then projects will just keep coming. Initially, you struggle to get all the project, then PST will say, Sir, you have to project as well. That stage will come. It should happen. It means that you should be so good that if God should ask you what you want, I mean, what you want out. So, so, so it is the way of doing it. So I think with these few, not few words, a lot of words, <laughs> I was asked to say a few words. But somehow I could not resist myself uh, in talking to you about this. And <clears throat> I also wish to tell you that it just went off my mind that I told you I have to be here. So I did not prepare myself for anything. Usually I prepare. So it was all impromptu. And I think uh, with this, I thank you once again. And thank you, ma'am, for this opportunity. Thank you, Ramay Medical College has always attracted uh, the brightest of students for both its graduate and postgraduate courses. Uh, 
but uh, we have also always known that they have the potential to perform good research. And uh, in the in the last you know the recent two years, we've seen that uh, in with the developing research environment, uh, many of the students have been able to achieve or uh, fulfill their research potentials. And it is uh, with pleasure that we we can get to hear from some of them, some of the successful students uh, here today. So I invite uh, our undergraduate and postgraduate students first, uh, and Dr. Karthik, who is a uh, third year MBBS student, to share a few words regarding his research. So, what's Good afternoon, everyone. I'm extremely humbled and thankful for this opportunity to present my perspective on research in medicine as I see. Medical school is very challenging, but it also presents so many new opportunities to learn, grow, and experience. Being surrounded by so many bright, insightful, and brilliant people, you can't help but be inspired and you feel a part of a community. I have the responsibility to make a most of it, and I intend to do just that. Breaking down complex problems is an art, and that art is research. And thankfully, it's an acquirable skill. In my last couple of years here at Ramya, I've had the privilege and opportunity to pursue projects in various disciplines. I, look up, I recently took up a project with the medicine department and biochemistry titled the Association of Lipid Accumulation Product and Cardiometabolic Index with insulin resistance and uh, body fat percentage in metabolically obese normal weight trials. I was awarded a grant under the ICMR short term research project grant. Out of the 13,000 to 14,000 applications that went in that year, 1,000 were approved. Coming up with a research question, drawing up a proposal, getting the funding, uh, scampering to make ends meet, making sure I attend every class, uh, running between the class and the lab, uh, following up with the patients, storing and running the samples, writing the report, doing the data analysis has been quite challenging. But I realized that all the experience I've gained, the next project should be less cumbersome and I should be able to do a lot more. I've also taken up a project with the Department of Gastroenterology titled the role of fecal calprotectin as a predictive marker for decomposition of chronic liver disease. Currently, I'm working on wrapping up the STS project, and I have many other ideas in the nascent stages that I wish to work on soon. Um, I've realized that research doesn't have to always be cutting edge or solve a very complex problem. Research is all about working towards a simple and yet elegant solution to a very big problem. Uh, also, if it's not cost effective and easily implementable or executable on ground, it does definitely need more work. Uh, interactions with my mentors has been an enriching experience. Uh, their mutual, the mutual respect we share, the time management, seeing them manage their busy schedules and also cater to us, and the passion for their work is what drives me as well. I look up to it and I wish to do that as well. I've, I've realized that I also have chosen a lifestyle. Uh, the importance that is given to ethics in this institution is inspiring. And it's abundantly clear how important it is to keep research patient centric. I also realize that uh, I can't look at patients just as a statistical point. I am truly grateful for the commitment of our faculty and our institution to kindle and support these research aspirations from early on in the course. The DRP and the research committee have been instrumental in changing my mindset and all my friends' mindset uh, among the students and take up many, many projects. The numerous workshops, the research methodology programs, the lectures, the seminars, the brown brainstorming sessions, interacting with experienced researchers, opportunities like this, um, and the Innovation Council have helped me a great deal. It's always research season. Every department is involved in various projects, and we're always constantly interacting with junior, juniors and seniors, and it's indeed a great environment for learning. There was never a time I was not thinking, reflecting, analyzing, writing. I was always working on an idea. This is what the mindset that research has helped me build up. This intellectually curious mindset is contributing to a sense of personal satisfaction and eagerness to engage in discovery and learning to be part of a team. I wish to future proof myself, uh, where research has gained an extremely important role in professional esteem and progression. I wish to provide better care for my patients and have better outcomes for my patients. Today, research dictates progress. It pushes the boundaries of what we know 
what we don't and taps into the potential of what we can be. Research, I believe, is therefore the key to a better tomorrow. We have the more, we, I have to make up and all of us have to make up the most of the research opportunities in the medical school and beyond, not only for my personal and professional benefits, but in contributing to healthcare of my patients and the community at large. Thank you, Dr. Karthik. Next, I'd like to call Dr. Anshin, who's our pioneer. Probably, actually, despite a sprained ankle, we have motivated her to come today. A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I would like to thank the management for giving me an opportunity to talk on the stage. It is hard to convey my perspective alone on clinical research without including the perspective of every resident. I have participated in the annual conference of the Bangalore Orthopedic Society, which was held in April 2022, and also the 34th annual conference of the Indian Foot and Ankle Society at Goa in August, where I presented my papers and fortunately won awards for the same. This included a cadaveric study on the anatomy of the foot, which I presented at the Bangalore Orthopedic Society conference, and another paper on effect of foot, effect of flat foot on the knee at the National Conference of Foot and Ankle Society in Goa. Apart from this, our team has eight more papers still underway. To start off on the perspective on clinical research, every clinical research requires a basic initial necessity, and that is a question. This question can be brought forward by us residents or more often by our guide. In my case, it was the latter. Then we thought about a methodology to go about to answer this question. This involves extensive literature search, other studies in this regard, discussions with the team, guides and the stalwarts in the field. This is how I went about initiating my study. Then we went ahead executing our plan, dissecting cadavers at the advanced learning center getting radiographs done for my patients and my colleagues who I'm immensely thank, thankful for being my subjects and compiling our results with help of statisticians. Now, this is portraying a very rosy picture of the reality faced while doing clinical research. There are a number of difficulties which I and each one of us faces while carrying out any research. Acquiring literature from all sources, updating the same as we go on with the project over a few months or years, the basic logistics and resources like the cost to be borne, acquiring permissions from every concerned authority for the use of the available infrastructure, availability of patients, being able to convince the patients, and the most importantly, being able to convince the ground staff and the management. However, the results of the study and the satisfaction of getting a positive result feels most of the efforts worth it. Publishing and presenting these results is the next hurdle to be crossed. This requires writing up, choosing a journal, formatting as per journal requirements, tedious submission formalities, and then the long wait for acceptance or rejection, which is seen in most cases. All this requires the support of a good, well-knit team. I would take this opportunity to thank my team. My guide, Dr. Ajoy and Dr. Ramesh have been very supportive and the backbone behind every project. Their participation and encouragement is what has been pushing us further. My HOD, Dr. Ashok Kumar, has also been in the background of all our studies in the department. A major part and the big brains behind all the studies which we have done is Dr. Dave, my batchmate who has been ever supportive in every study and presentation. Also, I would like to thank the institution for providing me with the necessary infrastructure, which includes the advanced learning center, the cadaveric lab, and the equipments at the physiotherapy department. I apologize if I have missed out on thanking anyone. Last, but not at all the least. We all know how taxing residency can be in India. After exhausting working hours or days in the wards, emergencies, OPDs and OTs, I always felt giving time to research is physically challenging and most importantly, mentally draining. We recently observed World Mental Health Day a couple of days ago, ago with the theme of making mental health a global priority. Mental health of residents is a concern in today's world which is neglected on a large basis by our own associates and superiors. The inhumane working arts and the inconducive work environment multiply our difficulties. 
every presentation which I have gone on stage for, every award I have won, every talk I have given, including this one, has been preceded by immense self doubt, fear, overthinking, large amounts of anxiety, which are hard to be expressed. It also included long talks with my team and therapy sessions with my psychiatrist, Dr. Hinendra, who I am very indebted to without whose calls, including the ones I made yesterday, this would not have been possible. The strong backing of my friends, Dr. Dave, Dr. Denny, Dr. Pooja, Dr. Hashita, Dr. Alpi, in name of few, was ever, ever important. My family, and especially my sister's contribution, has been immense towards standing here or on any stage before this. So, to conclude, I firmly believe that it is required for the entire doctor fraternity to empathize and support each other, especially the working residents, in nurturing a healthy working environment. And this is what becomes the cornerstone for good clinical research. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anjan, for the very uh, candid talk and wish you a very speedy recovery. Um, here at Ramya Medical College, we are fortunate enough to be able to boast about some research uh, stalwarts that we ourselves possess, and one of whom is uh, Professor Vijay Misurkaram. She is a senior professor in the uh, Department of Pathology, who has been here uh, at the Institute for more than over three decades. She is also in charge of the Central Research Lab at the Medical College uh, Hospital. And uh, ma'am has authored uh, 123 publications in international and national journals, and she's authored 12 chapters in textbooks, and is also an editorial uh, board member for the Indian Journal of Pathology and Microbiology. And she's been a guest speaker at several uh, CMEs, uh, both at state and national level. But most of all, it's her Indian personality and uh, a, a, a beloved nature which is uh, striking to all all the students at our medical college for a dedicated work i request ma'am to say a few words on this uh, occasion of research week good afternoon everybody so first of all i'm uh, i feel privileged to, to be here on the stage I'll be giving a small introduction to transitional uh, research. What exactly is transitional research? So first of all, what is basic research? Basic research is the foundation of medical discovery. So it gives key information about the fundamental biological, molecular, and chemical processes of life. And it is mainly laboratory based. Uh, for example, a uh, simple example, uh, suppose uh, in breast tissue, uh, we know that uh, estrogen and uh, progesterone receptors are present in, a, in some of the breast cancers. All that has been detected by in vitro studies on breast tissue in the laboratory. So then uh, the, they have also found out by in vitro studies that uh, by applying hormones to the, the, by taking various cell lines, they have found by uh, applying hormones, these uh, tumor cells can be killed. So that also is in vitro study, which is laboratory based. Similarly, if you take the example of uh, Hertonew overexpression, that is present in some uh, 20 to 25 percent of breast cancers. That also has been found out uh, by doing in vitro studies. And we have all, they have also done immunohistochemistry. They have been able to find out that there is Hertonew overexpression. By fish studies also, it has been found. All this is laboratory based. And they have also found out that uh, certain drugs will target these uh, areas and the cells can be uh, killed and uh, these tumor cells can be eliminated. So all this is laboratory based and this is very important. Basic research, of course, is very important, but we cannot stop at basic research. So then next, what is clinical research? Clinical research is study on human subjects. And it involves testing new methods of diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of illness. So just as an extension of what I just spoke about. So when the, the surgeon sees that uh, the patient whom he is dealing with, uh, the breast cancer case, uh, is having a tumor which is uh, having estrogen and progesterone receptors, he will find that this patient is uh, respond is uh, has a better prognosis. Uh, they, uh, after studying a large number of patients, after 
uh, following up a large number of patients, they may see that these patients have a better survival rate. The prognosis is good. On the other hand, when hertonium is present on the tumor cells, the tumor is more aggressive. The survival rate is uh, less, is the poor, and uh, the relapse rate is higher. So all these are done on patients. This is clinical research. This is the second wing. So clinical research is also very important. So next, now. Next. So what is translational research? Translational research bridges the gap between basic research and clinical research. So this is the process of taking a discovery from the laboratory into the clinic where it can ultimately help patients because it cannot stop at laboratory level and we cannot just do a study on the patients. We have to have both together. So translational research is a bridge between the laboratory and the clinic and the patients. So we can call it as bench to bedside or we can say bench to bedside to community research. This is what exactly is translational research. So it acts as a bridge between science and practice. So it links laboratory science with patients and findings with the needs of the community. So why do we call it translational? That is because basic and applied research are effectively translated into practice. Because it is translated into practice, we call it as translational research. So ultimately it has an impact and directly benefits the patients. So translational research is a subset of applied research. So it's a bi-directional process which involves multidisciplinary integration among basic clinical, pra uh, clinical practice, population, and policy-based research. So it starts with laboratory experiments, then gets extended to clinical trials, therapy, and point-of-care patient applications. So I gave the example of uh, tumor. It's, it doesn't uh, stop only at uh, tumors. Uh, for example, uh, Parkinsonism. Now by studying the brain tissue on autopsy, uh, on autopsy patients, uh, autopsy bodies, they can find certain uh, receptors, certain changes in the uh, brain cells or even at a biochemical level that uh, there are certain biochemical changes. All this is again laboratory based in vitro studies. Then we can, uh, uh, as an extension of that, they will find out what drugs can be used to uh, uh, deal with these changes, to reverse these changes. So then that ultimately becomes the treatment of Parkinsonism. The same thing for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the, uh, certain changes have been found in the brain tissue in Alzheimer's disease patients. So when we know the changes which are taking place, they can be, uh, rather than trying to reverse the changes, uh, isn't it better to prevent it? So we can even devise methods of preventing the onset of Alzheimer's disease. So this is how it starts at the laboratory level, finally goes to the clinical level, and then uh, goes to the community, and we can even prevent diseases by translational research. So the stages of translational research are uh, the T1, T2, and T3. This is how it has been divided. So T1 is developing treatments and interventions, testing hypotheses, making scientific discoveries using disease models in the laboratory. T2 is testing the efficacy and effectiveness of these new treatments and interventions. And T3 is dissemination and implementation for a system-wide change. So examples of T1 phase translational research are drug development, Studies of disease mechanisms, as I said, Parkinsonism, Alzheimer's, and a large number of other diseases. Proteomics, genomics, genetics, metabolomics, cell cultures, animal models, all these are examples of uh, translational research. So just to end my talk, uh, we have a central research laboratory where we have started research uh, activities. We, have, we offer biochemical tests, basic and advanced. A large number of our undergraduate students uh, do come and uh, do their uh, biochemical studies for the research projects in our laboratory. We have ELISA, uh, karyotyping, uh, we have sericulture, uh, fish, PCR, genome sequencing, we are outsourcing and uh, getting it done when required. Uh, we have facilities for immunohistochemistry, immunofluorescence, electrophoresis. So these are the facilities that we offer at our center research lab. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, as uh, uh, for the highlight talk or speech for today, we have with us uh, a very esteemed faculty, uh, Professor Nagasuma Chandra, ma'am. She is a structural biologist and a biochemist, professor in the Department of Biochemistry at IASC. 
She is also officially affiliated with the bioengineering and uh, mathematical biology initiatives at the Institute. Uh, she has established the area of molecular systems biology and contributed to the development of bioinformatics and genomic medicines at the Institute. Uh, Ma'am is also uh, involved in interdisciplinary research where uh, studies on how genome-wide molecular networks respond to a variety of pathological conditions and how that knowledge can be translated into biomedical applications is involved. Uh, she has also been elected as a fellow of the Indian Academy of Science and the Indian National Science Academy. Uh, Ma'am also has a over 175 publications in international journals. She has also co-founded a precision medicine company, uh, the Heal Stick, which has been incubated at IAC. As Charlie Mann said, she is also a recipient of the uh, a BIOS Award, that is the uh, biology, uh, a national biology award uh, for career development. She is one of the highest science science awards in the country. And uh, Ma'am has done pioneering, pioneering work uh, on uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, including uh, research that has helped to find new drug targets for the treatment of tuberculosis. I request uh, Ma'am Ma to uh, kindly give us uh, a, a talk on this occasion. <coughs> It's a great pleasure to be here and thank Dr. Shalini and Dr. Nandakumar for this kind invitation. I've been collaborating with uh, many people at uh, Kamaya Medical College over the years. We also published together and uh, the collaboration is ongoing, including with uh, Dr. Vijaya, Dr. Gayatri Devi, uh, two Gayatri Devis, one from microbiology and one from pulmonology and several other people. So, uh, thank you for the introduction. I feel it was, uh, uh, you know, much more than what it really is. But anyway, I'll try to make, uh, you know, give you a glimpse of what we've been doing uh, over the years. So, I'll touch upon genomic medicine. Um, I work on a variety of areas, but then this is what may, that may be of interest to you. I think Dr. Nandakumar gave a nice uh, title that I retained, Recording Omics for Clinical Practice. But also look at it, I will touch upon that as we go along. Precision medicine, you know, new paradigms, risks and opportunities, I will touch upon. Of course, we are right next door. Uh, most of you may have actually uh, come there. If not, you are welcome to visit us. Okay. I will just start off with a very uh, basic introduction to the complexity of the human body. I know I don't have to speak about this to this audience. You are... Uh, making sure that the human body is uh, well and safe all the time. And uh, of course, my I respect for that. Uh, the human body is a very complex thing. And we are now unraveling this complexity more and more. And that's where new opportunities come, new challenges come, paradigm shifts, and so on. This kind of images are familiar to you all the time. These are textbook images, right? Different cell types, macrophages, T cells, CD8 plus CD4 plus whatever. There are a variety of cells. In fact, what we now know is that there are something like 37 trillion cells in the body. Many, many, of course, this is uh, being known. But all of them are being recorded. So that's where the shift has happened. So everybody knew that how many cells are there. But we have detailed information about many, many cell types that are there. Over, um, uh, of course, I'm going to repeat it, project. This is just showing how many tissues are there. There's a big consortium working on creating this human cell atlas. So that's an important thing. But what does that actually give us? So each of these uh, so many trillion cells that are there in the body have a genome sequence, which is identical in all the cells. And that's expressed to different levels in different cells at different time points, different individuals, and so on. So each of these have this human genome. Okay, the human genome itself, again, I won't go into the chronology of uh, events that led to the discovery of this uh, human genome or the delineation of the genome sequence, as we call it. But it's one of the few projects that was completed ahead of time of this nature, large projects, with lower money spent on it than uh, initially anticipated, thanks to the computational power that was there, there assembly, putting together this genome sequence was made uh, much easier with the advances both on the hardware side as well as on the software side. 
So we do have the human genome sequence available to us. Now, what the genome sequence tells us, I'll show you in a minute, is the set of nucleotides, A, G, C, T, Z, and N, you know, billions of you know, billion letters basically. A genome sequence is only the code. Okay, the code has to be decoded, and only that leads to the different cell types that we see. And that leads to the interactions among cell to cell, which leads to tissues, to organs, and the whole human body, which keeps us uh, uh, well in the life. Okay. So we also require this other omics, multi ohms, uh, as it's called today. The most important of them is the number pointer. Okay. Yeah, that's good. sorry. I was using the wrong key. So we have here the genome sequence, which is just the set of letters which is static. That doesn't change. Okay, that's uh, hard work. But what changes is the transcription. So how much is each gene expressed? How much mRNA is made at each time? Which is a very very valuable. So that gives us a brilliant picture, like a snapshot, if you like, and a dynamic. Uh, uh, the, the process of obtaining snapshots over a time course. So that's the transcriptome. And the outcome of the transcriptome is the proteome. And you can say the outcome of the functions of these proteins is the metabolism. Of course, there is a two way interaction among all of these things. Uh, and we have uh, external things that are influencing us, which are the microbiome, the exposome, as people call it, like the environmental chemicals and things like that, that we are constantly exposed to. Some of these manifest as the epigenome where permanent changes are made and inherited and so on. But nevertheless, there are many, many homes. There are several more which I did for the sake of brevity, you know, not to confuse. So all of these things, there's a hierarchical organization, these things. So you do have genes which are controlled by other genes, other proteins. There is a regulatory network which leads to, you know, the protein-protein interaction network, which is our bread and butter, really. So we look at it on a daily basis for every single project. How do proteins interact with each other? How do proteins interact with genes, with lipid molecules, with the glycans, with, you know, carbohydrates of various kinds? Can we predict it? Can we put them together? It's a very complex picture. So you get networks. I've only shown a small, tiny 0.00001% perhaps of this, it's a it's like a big jungle. It's like a haystack which has been messed up. So you really do not know what where it starts, where it ends. It's a very complex set of interactions. And our job is to actually pull out cells out of this in, for each question that we are asking. In fact, genomics has uh, been a changing phase of biology for quite some time now, for about you know more than 10, 20 years. But the last 10 years has seen a lot of, a lot of rapid advance. The changes are on two fronts. First, it's changing our paradigms from looking at your favorite molecule, whether it's a gene or a protein, you know, you have a hypothesis and you're really analyzing that. People have spent their entire careers, not only theirs, but their students' careers also have gone on analyzing one molecule, studying one molecule. Okay. Now we are changing from, not that that's not important, it's given us a lot of data, which is what has enabled these kind of things. But the paradigm shift is that you look at everything. You get a helicopter view. You're no longer seeing just yourself and your neighbor and nothing else, but you get the entire city, entire world's view, and then choose what you want to study. Right? So that's the a complete unbiased genomic view is what we call it. That is what this enables us to have. And on the second front, which is more relevant and uh, following what uh, Dr. Vijaya was saying, so this enables translational research quite easily in the sense we had a hypothesis we would have an in vitro model like in a test tube you would test one molecule understand its function and then move on to perhaps a cellular level model and then to your preclinical mouse or hamster or whatever you like a model of that kind and only then it came to the clinical side okay. but getting data of this kind directly from patient samples skips all those steps and you can go from a hypothesis to your clinical model you can go from the data to a hypothesis. You don't even need to have a hypothesis to start. You can derive hypothesis rationally. So that's the paradigm shift that this has been enabling. So what we get is that it's not as simple as I make it out to be. You get billions of these letters. If we were to print this, 
in books, it would fill up uh, you know, several of these rooms. Really. So how do you read that, digest it, and have make sense out of it? So that's the challenge. Okay, all you have is these letters. And there may be a phenotype, which will be a different, a tradition, and a few characteristics to describe that phenotype. So now we have to pull out all of these. So that's the challenge, and that's where bioinformatics has become a very important area for it. And bioinformatics, of course, there is big data, so there is computational science. It's an interdisciplinary area. You need to be able to digest this information by combining it with uh, domain knowledge. You know, domain knowledge, both from the biology domain as well as from the clinical domain. This is where collaborations become very important and the key really to make problems and, uh, to understand diseases and to be able to treat them. Okay. So just to give you an idea of what genomics tells us and how insufficient it is for our understanding, I think this cartoon may be useful. Okay. Most of you may be familiar with that, you know, blind men and the elephant. So there are several blind men here. Uh, who look at the elephant and they're so sure that one of them is sure it's a wall, another one is sure it's a fan or a spear or a snake, whatever, because that's all they can see. Right? Because our view is restricted to that much and it does really feel like a snake, nothing more than that. But if you see it from far, if you get a helicopter view of this whole thing, you know, you can very readily tell it's an elephant. And what genomics helps us is to <laughs> provide a path list, like there are several parts, somewhat like that complex Lego set that you have seen your children play with. So it, it provides us a part, uh, it, it provides a set of parts, but does not provide an annotation or a color or an assembly code of whether to put one next to two or two next to three, two is green and three is blue, no such thing. I mean, it doesn't tell us what the annotation is. That's the job of bioinformatics to annotate each of these parts and to even understand you should place one next to four. And there are, remember there are uh, uh, 3.2 billion uh, of these letters, which may be 25,000, 23,000 genes, but there are many, many intergenic regions and many regions which don't translate into any protein at all. So this is insufficient because we have lots and lots of data. We may be able to annotate some of them, but it's not enough. It's also somewhat like having, a, a, at least people of my generation would have seen a telephone directory, right? So where you have listing of names and telephone numbers, it it's all gone somewhere, okay. Uh, but then that's not enough to understand, having a telephone directory is not enough to understand what a city does, what is the main occupation of a uh, city or even as an institution. Can, by looking at the telephone directory of an institution like this, would you be able to say it's a medical college or a hospital versus say it is a, a software company, right? That is difficult. But if you had yellow pages, if you have classified pages where you say that number of these people are software engineers, a number of these people are doctors with this specialization and so on, then you can start guessing. So bioinformatics can provide you that kind of yellow pages. But in order to know what activity is going on at a given point of time, you need to know who is calling who and how much and what and how does it cascade if you are able to write it down as a sequence of phone calls, events. Okay? You may be able to figure out the activity. In fact, by the way, uh, the uh, uh, police departments, I'm told, use this kind of uh, software to understand if there's any terrorist activity or if there's any uh, activity that you can expect right? by looking at there are graph theory. There are many types of mathematical and computational models for it. So it is the systems biology that provides this framework to start looking at who's talking to whom and when and how often and so on and in what numbers. You know, unlike in a in a telephone directory where you'll have only one occurrence of a person. A person is listed only once. In a human body, a cell is not, or a molecule is not listed just once. We'll have many copies of some molecules, like hemoglobin, for example, in millions in each cell. Whereas very few copies of some other molecules, such as a transcription factor, in each cell. And in some cells, it's present. In some cells, it's not present. Right? Like melanocytes, for example, have things that are important for keratinocytes for pigment formation, which is not seen in all centers. So it's very, very specific. So it's the systems biology that gives us this framework. Okay. And systems biology, in a nutshell, is something like this. You have lots of data, typically experimental data, and 
Of course, we can do it from preclinical models, but we, uh, in my lab especially, we've been looking at it from clinical samples and uh, combine it with the decades of you know, how of cellular and molecular interactions put them together and make mathematical models to be able to comprehend this complex information, simulation and analysis out here. In fact, each little square that you can see here is a result of about thousand simulations. Right, to be to enthrop, you know, to capture different processes. And then once it's a verified model, it becomes predictive. You can use it for addressing a variety of questions. What if there is a mutation, that is a polymorphism, in somewhere in this uh, thing? How does it change into the expression data? How does it change this kind of interactions that you see? What kind of changes that are affected in the models and therefore the simulations and so on? Like the HER2 receptor that you talked about. What if there is a mutation or a TR2 is overexpressed in certain, certain subtype of uh, risk cancer patients? Can we capture that kind of information here? So that's exactly what this does. So in my lab, we've been looking at uh, uh, systems biology and genomic medicine. So broadly, pathway modeling, reactor modeling, and all of that. And with an eye uh, on drug discovery and explaining post-heterogeneity, why do different people respond differently to different diseases or different treatments and so on. In the interest of time, I won't go through all of them. But we are quite inspired by one statement by a French philosopher, Marcel Bro. The only real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscape, but in having new eyes, new ways of analyzing data and so on. Again, it's a crowded slide. Do not uh, worry, I won't go through all of them. But uh, we do work at different levels. One at the individual molecular level, then at the pathway level, then at the cell-cell interaction level, and then putting multi-scale responses, tissues, and so on. And what you see in this column are different types of computational models that are available for addressing specific questions, depending on the data and depending on the question that you to ask. So uh, we've been we started much of our work in tuberculosis, both at the host and the pathogen, looking at drug resistance, drug targets, drug combinations. And uh, our work on host led us to work on many, many other diseases. And right? we've been looking for general patterns among uh, patients in a variety of diseases, especially using blood transport terms. So 100 plus diseases to see why the response of one disease in a uh, some other reasons, and so okay. as well as with uh, clinicians. Okay. And this again is a familiar picture just to draw your attention. But it's in the three branches for the diagnosis, treatment, or prevention, irrespective of the way in which it is practiced, whether it is, uh, uh, you know. Physiological or biochemical, you know, period of time. All of them need to have a common molecular basis. And you can take the argument forward to say all of them need to have a systems basis of medicine. And uh, again, let me skip this. We've been working on the pathogen and the host and asking questions of which genes are essential in the pathogen. Why does mycobacterium tuberculosis gain drug resistance? What are the molecular mechanisms of resistance? These are much beyond the mutations that we are all familiar with. There are systems-wide uh, you know, mechanisms that are involved. And therefore, how can we have a combination of drugs rationally chosen among the kitty that is available to us to be able to uh, treat an MDR patient, for example? You know, which two drugs, when used together, enhances resistance, this cross-resistance, although they have not encountered a particular drug, but they can be cross-resistance. And which two drugs will suppress resistance? So that's the kind of questions that we've been asking. And similarly, in the host, you know, what kind of, is there a vulnerability or susceptibility that is different in a host in two individuals? Why do some people contract disease and some others don't? You know, we've seen so much of this during the COVID times uh, recently. This is a little bit uh, an image. Uh, so I think it's uh, it was about four years, five years of work to make one uh, figure like this. But what this led us is to look at the pathogen and then say, which are the most useful drug targets? What is it that we should be targeting in latent tuberculosis, in active tuberculosis, and uh, in drug resistant tuberculosis, and so on? This again combined a variety of things such as uh, systems, sequence, structural analysis, and uh, so on. I won't get into the details of that. 
So for me, much of it is available. Um, and our contributions to drug the, uh, discovery have gone on beyond the target identification to drug. Uh, you know, these are fundamental aspects of drug. Especially strategic combinations of drug targets. So, so I quickly touch upon the host now. And we'll show you the omics part. This is transcriptomics. Transcriptomics in a nutshell, most of you may already be familiar with that. This is to say how much of gene expression is there at a given point of time. Right? In a large building, it's somewhat like saying it's, there are lights everywhere, but only when you walk in, some lights come up and some lights don't. So only when there's a need, some lights light up and sometimes dim, sometimes bright, depending on what the software has been fired for. It's very similar in our uh, cells also. These genes are like lights. They light up in the sense there is more expression at times, there's less expression at times. But there is economy that is being uh, you know, satisfied. System doesn't want to invest and new. And so, so with, and these are transcriptome. Each row here is a gene, a portion I have shown. Each row is a gene, and the color refers to the amount of expression, gene expression. So our algorithms, the computational algorithms, without being told who is who, we just ask them to group, group these, all these people. We'll automatically get all the healthy people on one side. And the TB people, you know, active TB here. And after treatment is different from, you know, before treatment. In fact, after treatment is very similar to healthy So, which is a beautiful thing. So, it's an agnostic classification of samples of healthy, active TB, and treated TB. This is not restricted to TB. I do the same exercise with liver cancer. It groups into different stages. It groups based on etiologies, uh, who is with, uh, has the uh, HCC, for example, based on hepatitis B or hepatitis C or alcohol or whatever that means. It just classifies quite beautifully. Now we have used this data by combining our uh, network approach that you see here, protein protein interaction network, informing these networks with this transcript of data to identify gene panels. Now, traditionally, people look at gene panels based on mutation. Is there a mutation? Therefore, if you are there's a mutation, therefore, I can say this person is more vulnerable and so on. But we've gone a step further to, uh, as well have been looking at this recently. These are called, instead of DNA panel, these are RNA panels. And as a quantitative panel, if you look at RNA gene expression, and like a barcode, you get that information, and then say that if I measure, the gene expression values of these genes, nine genes, 10 genes, five genes, whatever it may be. Can I say what kind of a condition is? Can I say somebody has TB or somebody is healthy and can be monitor their treatment response? Right? So that's the kind of biomarkers we've been discovering based on uh, the host response to tuberculosis. So this, you know, I think all of you are familiar that how TB is detected is through, uh, the best way to detect it is through uh, the fastest way to gene expert and things like that, which looks for Pathogen DNA. So we are looking at host response and then we look for host RNA. So that's the difference here. Yeah. In collaboration with Rajiv Gandhi HSTC Hospital, we've been looking at responders versus non responders for tuberculosis. Again, each patient here is shown as a column. Each row is a time point. All the green are good responders, red are poor responders, detected by our algorithm in the, on the top. And a good agreement here with what was clinically found. In some cases, wherever there were question marks, we were able to provide some answers. And that is what you see here in these maps as well. Looking at data itself, you can separate out green versus red. Right? And in a variety of cases, we've been doing that. But we started uh, based on the translational potential of this my institute, encouraged me uh, to have a startup where we are taking it forward for development and collaborating with Ramaya as one of the partner hospitals, the five multicentric uh, clinical trials in the process right now. This again is a collaboration with Ramaya here. 
that Tridevi was uh, involved. And here, uh, this is to say, can we say uh, uh, whether somebody has a viral infection or a bacterial infection? In some cases, it's easy, but in many other cases, it's not a trivial question at all. The symptoms can be overlapping quite heavily. So by taking a small amount of blood sample, uh, even the previous one was with a blood sample. So taking a small amount of blood sample, looking at this entire transcriptomics, we were able to come up with a signature of uh, 10 gene signature, which when measured using, say, RT-PCR or uh, any kind of uh, RNA measurement technology, will be able to tell us if something is a uh, viral infection or a bacterial infection. Uh, Application of that, the translation potential of that, I don't need to tell you. You know very well the treatment uh, regimes are very different for viral bacterial infections. The next one, as an example, is for predicting risk and metastasis in melanoma. This was a collaboration with a leading clinician in uh, UK, St. James Hospital, University of Leeds, in Dr. Bishop. And here we looked at uh, melanoma patients who are primary and then predicted again using similar technology whether they were at a risk for that, you know, developing metastatic melanoma. And a single marker, uh, a small panel actually was able to tell us that there was a risk score for metastasis, which was also linked to the survival data. And we can with this kind of plots where if somebody had that uh, high level subject marker, their risk for uh, survival was poor, it was high. Quickly, so there's a branch of medicine, like I said, is precision medicine. Now, this was all genomic. But precision medicine, the need for that, let me just illustrate here. Again, these are the plots. I won't go into what these plots are, but you know, these are like box plots or scatter plots that you are very familiar with. Each dot in any of these things will refer to one sample, one patient sample. But you see a big spread, right? and you put it down to variability, natural variability. We don't give it a second thought. If we get less variability, they'll be worried what's wrong. So this variability actually means that if you look at this, this is effect of uh, ER, PR, and HER to status. Look at this dot out here. So for this patient, the treatment that you give for the rest of them may not work at all, right? or may work much better. So it's not just variability. It is just saying that, the, of course, it is variability. But you cannot just put it down and say, you know, for this patient, nothing will work. Something else may work if we understand the reason for that. So that is what we are trying to look at that. Again, we can use this kind of principal component analysis, a variety of data analysis techniques to separate them out and to understand them better, which has led to a new area called uh, precision medicine. Again, it's a new paradigm shift in treatment where the simple logic is that one size will not fit all. Again, it's not at all difficult to convince anybody about the need for this. But how to do it was a problem previously, and now using omics data, it is a possibility. So here you simply take a group of people, look for biomarkers of various kinds, DNA, RNA, protein, metabolome, whatever that may be, and then group them, stratify them, you know, subtype them, group them, and then see what will work for whom. This will also lower the failure rates. In the sense, we say it is whatever has worked will work in 60% of patients. Why only in 60 is something this can answer? What can you do with the other 40 may also be answered by this. So this is useful for disease susceptibility, risk assessment, biomarkers are very precise biomarkers. And this is staging, this is prognosis, patient subtyping, optimal treatment strategy, and so on. It's also a group in the US where they have used it for working out the timing between two drugs and cancer patients. It's not just giving a giving the correct cocktail, but saying what should be given when, based on the mechanism of action of the drug. They give one inhibitor first and then a kinase inhibitor so that when the cell cycle has reached a certain stage, that can be. So that was a beautiful okay. concept. So uh, some examples from our work is patient subtyping is in again uh, liver cancer based on the NAD status, right? And then we are recently appeared in uh, frontiers in oncology. And then in some category of patients, maybe NAD supplementation may be beneficial in liver cancer. So that is what we found using this. It looks somewhat like this. These are all reactions and biochemical reactions based on NAD levels. Each one is a patient and you use algorithms and cluster them and you get a picture of uh, what is this. 
And this is an example again from our uh, work uh, a couple of years ago of looking, understanding the reason for sorafenib resistance or sorafenib failure in liver cancer patients. And what we found was uh, the bioavailability of the sorafenib analog. You know, sorafenib is a, is a drug and also a program. It gets converted into a derivative. And that derivative, as well as the redox stress that was uh, you know, faced by the cancer cells, was inadequate in some people because there was uh, lower levels of this enzyme called glutathione uh, in uh, transfers. Right? So when you combine it with an inhibitor of this glutathione transferase, then the effect of serafinib was much better. So this has not been a clinical uh, study so far. It's still been a preclinical in vitro cell line, but it has potential to be addressed. Uh, but these are some of the examples, like I said, uh, we are taking some of these things forward through a development stage to the startup that uh, we have incubated in the company, and uh, which we are looking at patient stratification, this is staging and treatment uh, selection. Let me end with this. I must acknowledge my entire group. So it's a little bit of an older picture, but there are a whole lot of them who have contributed, and many of the many of them have moved on, uh, you know, into the top labs in the world, and some of them have their own labs as well. This uh, let me thank you for your attention. Yeah. It would be great to stay back in the class uh, to receive a program of appreciation on our behalf by just planning on to present. Happy to answer questions as well. So we just wait for any questions. Any questions from the audience? Well, a very enlightening talk, ma'am. Thank you for sharing and giving us a glimpse into the kind of advanced research that you You said uh, I had uh, talked uh, too much about uh, yeah, on your uh, regarding you, but I'm has a Wikipedia page on her, and in that uh, they mentioned that lab at IAC is named after Ma'am Chandra. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One of the future concerns in the public health in general is antimicrobial resistance. And I saw that uh, one of the studies that you are looking into is uh, differentiating between viral and bacterial infections. Uh, other than that, what do you think can be uh, the research aspect that can be looked into to fight this uh, public health problem? Yeah. This is a very important problem, and we are seeing in the news every day that you know, India is from AMR capitals in the world, unfortunately. Yes, that was for AMR surveillance to see uh, a stewardship uh, order, who should be given antibiotics and when. The common strategies, as you are aware, are this rotation of uh, antibiotics, okay? uh, where you allow the drug to become sensitive again and then hit it. So, but from our research, we have found that choosing the right combination is a very important thing, which has not been practiced uh, so far in the clinic because there hasn't been enough data coming from that. So but that's obviously one way, I think, going forward. So give the right combination so the cross resistance will not develop. For example, there may be a reflux pump that may be putting out one drug. The same reflux pump is putting out another drug also. So if you give isoniazid and etionamide together, it may be a waste. Whereas if you give isoniazid and some other thing, then it will work. So what is the mechanism of action is what we need to think. And also a cocktail of drugs. Uh, not just a combination for different targets, but for the same target, what kind of a cocktail should we give so that new drug resistant mutations don't come up? So, I think the answer in short is to look at deeply why resistance is happening and then hit it hard. Thank you, ma'am. Any other questions? Uh, no, then uh, I request uh, Charlie Man to present uh, some appreciation. Yeah. 
Thank you, Shani, and to also present the token of appreciation for a very much successful man. It was man thing. Uh, and Kumar sir to uh, present the uh, token of our application for our uh, students for the answer. And the uh, Thank you so much. Uh, with the deviation, I would just like to propose a vote of thanks. No, we had not. Thanks, Akshay, for uh, comparing and uh, coordinating the program very well. And uh, Till after we were having some jitters, man, last minute printing of the posters had not been done. And uh, a program of this magnitude always comes with challenges. Uh, so the list of people whom we would be thanking is uh, very enormous because for the next three days we are having this uh, event of uh, the posters and we have invited people in, uh, tomorrow for industry academic collaboration and day after tomorrow for uh, oration and other activities. Uh, but uh, the management, the invited guests, and more importantly, the people who are in this hall, because like we have sent the communication uh, well in advance four or uh, five times to more than 4,000 people across the campus. And the intent for research, as someone told, first it should be passion, otherwise it will be compassion and it's <laughs> common sense. So in that sense, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Nagasuma Ma who has always been the uh, uh, sort of like whenever we approach with IAC, the collaboration and some of the projects that she mentioned with the guy with the and guy with Yuchi Man. So it's, it's that organic relationship and collaborations that uh, make a difference. Thanks for accepting our uh, invite and uh, addressing the audience. The uh, uh, main vote of thanks probably I deserve it for the last day, but uh, Dr. Shani Ma'am has been very helpful along with uh, the DRP team over here and the uh, rest of the top management who has been kind enough to facilitate this uh, program of research week rather than a research day when you have compressed everything so they have spread it over a period of uh, three days. So thanks and uh, thanks Akshay and Ravi, we need your help for the next three days. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank <laughs> you. Everybody for today. today. We have uh, refreshments. Please go outside. Please join. They have not signed that. Uh, he comes as the most signing.